Well, I'm very excited that our next panel, um, uh, sort of kind of in keeping with taking tough issues and not just talking about it, um, but addressing it and figuring out solutions to some of the, um, the, the, the challenges and the dilemmas that we've been facing in the substance use disorder field on uh, sort of a continuation. I'm really excited to have um, Director Alicia Nelson and uh, Dr. Valerie Earnshaw uh, join us today for this panel. Um, we, um, we talk a lot about stigma. We talk a lot about um, how to um, provide more information and education to families and communities. And we're really excited to be a part of a, a project and in partnership with Director Nelson and, and Dr. Earnshaw to, to really tackle those things head, head on. Um, I thought uh, for uh, just sort of a quick um, overview on, on this uh, session, we have a, a little uh, less than an, an hour and I'm trying to, to keep us on time. Um, uh, Director Nelson, uh, an overview of sort of the project and how we started working together. And then um, Dr. Earnshaw, some of your overview on um, uh, stigma and understanding sort of the components of stigma and how it manifests, I think is helpful. I'm happy to jump in and give a, um, uh, a, a brief uh, overview of the program itself that APF has been working on, and then Dr. Earnshaw has some results for us. So um, I think we're going to have to shuffle some PowerPoint decks back and forth, if you like, but I'm so excited that you both um, have joined us and were able to take time this afternoon to join our conference. So thank you. Thanks for having um, us, and, and this is Alicia. Um, I am having some Zoom connectivity, so I'm joined via phone and by my computer. As soon as my computer comes back online, I'll throw up a couple slides, um, uh, but just to keep us on task here, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, I wanna thank you guys for uh, the work and the opportunity to talk about um, the partnership. Uh, we have been working alongside the Addiction Policy Forum for a long time, but before we go into that, I want to tell you a little bit about who we are. Um, my name is Alicia Nelson. I am um, inside the governor's office here in Ohio, Governor Mike DeWine, and we run the Recovery Ohio Initiative. And, and quickly, you know, we understood that when we... Um, came into office that we would have to tackle comprehensively uh, both issues with addiction and mental health and, and really wanted to do so uh, in, in the driver's seat. And so he established Recovery Ohio and we've been able to work alongside several, um, actually more than several, over 17 agencies. And for Ohio, that means agencies like the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, of course, but also agencies like the Department of Rehabilitations and Corrections, um, the Ohio Department of Health. Um, and in Ohio, we have own, our own separate Department of Medicaid and so many more, public safety, um, youth services. You know, I think it's just been a robust effort. And, and from these uh, conversations, we have developed a lot of services and programs to meet all or as many of the needs as we can uh, for Ohio residents from prevention, treatment, and recovery support services. And I'm going to turn my video at least on here on my phone until we can get the, the Zoom link back up so I'm not talking. Uh, you, you guys just don't hear me. You can see me elaborating here. Um, and so uh, we do that in, in with the partnership of those agencies but we also do that in partnership with community and, and listening is a key for us to individuals and families that have been impacted, our treatment provider networks, our healthcare system, our faith leaders, our criminal justice uh, uh, agencies, departments. And so to do that, um, we have this established a Recovery Ohio Advisory Council. This group, um, has continued to, to guide us, uh, and we are so honored. Um, I always say Ohio is lucky to have Jessica on uh, from the Addiction Policy Forum on our council, and she comes to every meeting and, and really brings all of the great work that we've heard here today. I'm excited to even hear more new programs, and, and hopefully I can get a comfort dog as well. 
um, because I think it's just such a great idea. So kudos to all of you who are doing the great work. But we know at the state, we won't have all the great ideas, but at least with the advice of these groups and folks like Jessica, we, we wanted to start and hit the ground running with what we needed to do in Ohio immediately to address addiction and mental health in our communities. And so we set out and we put together a 75 point plan. Uh, feel free to visit recoveryohio.gov if you wanna check us out. It's, it's a report and we're calling it our initial report that lays out the 75 recommendations that our state who has been greatly impacted by uh, addiction and overdose death as well as suicide, unfortunately, um, all the things that our state could do to work on, um, you know, driving these numbers down. And so we've been excited uh, to implement a number of those uh, recommendations, but one of those domains, one of the nine domains within that report was around stigma. And we wanted to um, make sure that we were addressing stigma in every way we can and fortunately for us had the opportunity to partner with uh, the Addiction Policy Forum to develop uh, a pilot in our state and really target the communities who we felt needed it most. And you'll hear more about that here in a moment, but just appreciate the partnership with the Addiction Policy Forum and, and really the evaluation efforts that you'll see today to, to showcase how this work can work um, and measurable results to address stigma can be achieved. And so we are excited and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Earnshaw and Jessica to tell you more. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Director Nelson. We're, we're, we love our partnership with you and this the pilot this year has just been so exciting to work on. I think Ohio is um, very lucky to have you leading these efforts. Um, and um, the progress that you've made, getting stakeholders together, a focus on the full continuum from prevention, treatment, recovery, um, public health responses. Um, you, you just really have taken this up to a different level that has, is, is obvious when you see the work that's happening on the ground throughout your state. So you deserve a lot of recognition for, for all that you've been able to do and really elevating these issues um, in the state as well. Um, I'm also really excited that uh, Dr. Valerie Earnshaw from the University of Delaware can, um, is able to join us. Um, I think if we give a bit of an overview, as I mentioned, um, we talk about stigma a lot, but Dr. Earnshaw has taught me um, and a lot of the team members here at APF about what that really means and the different components and ways that we can measure stigma and also what tools we have in our toolbox to change it. Um, and that those have been um, really fundamental and transformative pieces for us to do work on the ground. So Dr. Earnshaw, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for that kind introduction. Okay, so as Jess mentioned, today I'm just going to give a very, you know, brief overview of some stigma basics to set us up for really this intervention approach, as well as to set us up for how we measured intervention or the um, changes in stigma um, going alongside this intervention. So our definition of stigma has actually evolved quite a bit from when a sociologist named Goffman first introduced it in the 1960s. So today, theorists describe stigma as a broad social process that emerges at the co-occurrence of labeling, stereotyping, separation, status loss, and discrimination, all happening within a power context. And it's this social process that results in some marks, characteristics, or identities like substance use disorders really being constructed within societies as indicators of tarnished characters or basically of certain people being seen as less than or worse than others. So when I'm using this term stigma today, I'm really referring to a broad social process. So this is all like really interesting, at least to me, uh, but it does start to feel a little bit fuzzy when we try to think about, well, how does a broad social process, which is pretty abstract, actually get under the skin and harm people's efforts at recovery? Well, this broad social process is manifested, and by that I mean it's really expressed and it's experienced within our structures and within individual people, 
and it's expressed and experienced as what I'm going to refer to as stigma manifestations. And these stigma manifestations are a really good place for us to focus our attention because they are measurable and they are changeable. So these broad social processes are difficult to quantify, but we can quantify stigma that's manifested in people or individuals. So you're going to see how we did, how we used surveys and scales to do that. And then these manifestations are also changeable. So we do have evidence-based tools that we know can either reduce them or really protect people from them. And I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute. Okay, so the work that we're gonna be sharing today is really focused on community members. So our family and friends, our neighbors, our coworkers and healthcare providers. And scientists sometimes refer to these folks as perceivers or perpetrators of stigma. And I'm gonna share how it is that this group experiences and expresses stigma towards folks who may um, have substance use disorders or be in recovery. So first community members may endorse stereotypes which really reflect people's thoughts. I like to say that they live in the mind. Stereotypes are group-based beliefs that may be applied to individual people. So people with substance use disorders are characterized, um, or sorry, they're perceived as dangerous, unpredictable, responsible for their condition, and not capable of decision making. They, um, the second manifestation that we think about is um, prejudice. So folks may endorse prejudice, and this really reflects people's feelings. So I like to say that this is the one that lives in the heart. So prejudice involves negative emotions and attitudes. And research suggests that prejudice towards people with substance use disorders is really characterized by um, feelings, express, feelings expressing contempt and moral outrage. So things like anger, disgust, hate, and blame. And then last, this group may enact or discrimination. And this is the behavioral component of stigma. It's, it's basically what people do. And so discrimination involves poor, unfair, or unjust treatment of individuals. And this spans rejecting people with substance use disorders, firing or not hiring them, and giving them poor medical care. So I just want to take a moment to emphasize that the literature, the research really does suggest that stigma from a wide range of different types of community members blocks people's efforts at recovery. So I want to share a few examples. So people with substance use disorders who anticipate or expect more stigma from community members just in general report that they're less likely to start treatment. I have a few uh, yellow quote bubbles here in these slides, and these are from participants of our studies, and they're just here to illustrate what this might look like. So for example, this was from a young person um, who didn't want to get help because they were scared about what people in high school would think of them if they found out. Research also suggests that stigma from friends and families leads to uh, worse mental health and continued substance use because people have learned to cope with poor treatment from others through substance use. And it also leads to less treatment engagement. We're seeing a lot of participants in our studies um, trying to stop or come down off of their medications for opioid use disorders like methadone because their family doesn't understand or stigmatizes those medications. Stigma from employers can lead people to be fired or not hired in the workplace, which can then block access to really critical resources for recovery. And stigma from healthcare providers is, is associated with receiving worse healthcare in general, as well as worse treatment for addiction specifically. So this quote is from a mother describing a discharge summary from an ER doctor um, after her daughter overdosed. So she was really upset that there was no referral for this chronic relapsing and deadly disease that brought her daughter to the ER. She just got this really rude note and she immediately um, identified this to me as an example of discrimination. And then stigma within recovery communities could lead to isolation from a really important source of social support. So we do have evidence that alcoholics and narcotics anonymous are helpful uh, for some people, they can really work. Uh, but when many of our participants share that they're receiving treatments for opioid use disorders at these meetings, they're told that they're not um, really in recovery, at least some of them are. And then these individuals stop going to the, these meetings and they stop accessing what is a really helpful source of social support. So unfortunately, there's no one silver bullet to stop stigma, uh, just like there's no one solution or one silver bullet to end addiction. But we do have many tools in the stigma intervention toolkit. In other words, we have uh, developed a sense of strategies that do work to decrease stigma. 
And we have tools to address stigma at the structural level, like within our policies and social norms, among our community members, which is our focus today. Um, and then also among people with substance use disorders or in recovery themselves. So I'm gonna just quickly highlight some of our tools for community members. One of our most powerful ways to address stigma among community members is through contact. So contact is how sharing personal stories can change stigma. And we do have a lot of research on this as a field. Uh, this strategy appears to be effective at reducing stigma associated with many different characteristics, so substance use, race, HIV, others as well. And contact can either happen in person, like when two people are interacting with each other, talking, or it can happen vicariously, such as, um, you know, interacting or, or uh, digesting media, like um, through a TV show or books or watching a talk over Zoom. And research suggests that contact leads to increased empathy and perspective taking with stigmatized individuals in the short term. It also leads to more knowledge as people start to learn more about the people that they're interacting with or hearing from, which leads people to start to question those stereotypes. And then it leads to reduce anxiety about interacting with stigmatized, in the, about with stigmatized individuals in the future. And then in turn, this leads to lower prejudice or improved feelings towards stigmatized individuals. And we know that lower prejudice paired with reduced uh, stereotypes can lead to a lower likelihood of discrimination over the long term. Another pretty powerful tool that we have is education, knowledge, or information-based interventions. And these are also another one of our most well-studied interventions to address stigma. And the goals of these interventions are typically to refute stereotypes and also to improve cultural competence. Education-based education interventions have been studied in a wide range of contexts as well, including mental illness, HIV, and LGBTQ stigma. And the evidence does suggest that they tend to have at least a medium-sized effect at reducing stigma. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jess to introduce um, Encompass. Thank you, Dr. Earnshaw. Get my slides up really quickly. Oop, oh, having trouble sharing my screen. I'm gonna try one more time. Did that work that time? Awesome. Um, so we are, we're really excited to um, launch this project in um, partnership with Recovery Ohio, uh, with Director Nelson and her fantastic team and with Governor DeWine. Um, and there, there's sort of kind of multiple objectives with Encompass. Um, one, again, is same as sort of our, our previous conversation, uh, doing the tough things, not just talking about some of our trickiest parts in the field, but trying to come up with new solutions. Uh, so building a stigma intervention that um, can move the needle on the things that Dr. Earnshaw just uh, described that are sort of components of stigma. Because um, we say the S word a lot, right? So, and it's been sort of a trendier topic for a bit, um, but I, I think we really need to rely on researchers like Dr. Earnshaw to really know what that means, know how we change it, know how to measure it, and to make sure that we are holding ourselves accountable for movement in the right direction. And the second part is, um, you know, we, we do a lot of work with um, family members and community members. I'm an impacted family member myself, and there is not a lot of information or, or support and assistance to help you navigate this really complicated chronic illness. Um, so uh, sometimes when, when we do a quick overview of Encompass, I, um, I share just a little bit of my personal why on why we've um, we've spent so much so much time putting this together. Uh, I lost my my dad uh, 20 years ago now. He died in 2001, and um, before he passed away, and he struggled with heroin use disorder and crack cocaine, um, and was homeless in Los Angeles, and really had struggled for many years. But he he did reach out and wanted help and to find treatment and got to that, um, that, that moment of wanting care and to do something about his addiction. 
And I, at the time, I worked with General McCaffrey at ONDCP. I was working in this field more on the policy side, and it still was completely and utterly overwhelming. Um, I describe it as, as sort of feeling like you're drowning with no one to sort of throw you that you know, lifesaver ring to, to help you out. It, it's, it's, you're in crisis, you're worried that someone you love is going to die, you don't really know who to call, you're not posting a message on Facebook to your entire friends and family network, like looking for a dentist. There's so much stigma associated with this, which keeps us kind of in the shadows and sometimes ashamed of even reaching out to help someone we're worried about. Sometimes I also say it feels like you get hit by a Mack truck. I'm not sure which metaphor I like best, but you get the picture. It's hard, it feels lonely, you don't know where to go. And yet when we have a diagnosis of someone we care about for diabetes or cancer or heart disease, it feels like you know what to do. There's pamphlets and information and patient advocacy groups and trainings and a seminar on a Sunday morning that you can show up to. It, it, it feels like a very different experience for different illnesses. And we at Addiction Policy Forum, we want to change that. We want to fundamentally change what it feels like when this illness um, uh, happens to your family, when you're dealing with this as a family member or as a patient yourself. We want to change what it feels like and what information you have access to. So here we have Encompass. Um, and I have a very short uh, overview, and I, I know we want to leave time for Q&A and to go over um, the, uh, uh, some of the results with Dr. Earnshaw. Um, but the basics are, um, you know, we know that you can go get CPR trained um, or get first aid training from the American Red Cross. Uh, but where do you go for like the boot camp, right? Where, where could I have gone in 2001 to get the boot camp on all uh, I wish I had known on how do you treat opioid use disorder and stimulant use disorder. So we've we've built the things that I wish that I had had access to, access to myself as a family member. Um, so you learn signs and symptoms, assessment, all the different components of treatment and really sort of dissecting um, interventions versus clinicians versus settings. We talk about recovery support and recovery capital. Um, uh, medications, it's a whole host. And who is this accessible to? Anyone, family, friends, um, anyone who works at a company, you want to have more information to help a colleague or someone that reports to you, um, employers, uh, healthcare providers, policymakers, anyone in criminal justice, anyone in school systems or in the education field. We wanted to um, uh, develop a multi, um, sort of multi-purpose, multi-audience, um, intervention that really helps um, address stigma, but also gives people the knowledge and the tools um, to help someone who's in crisis. Um, and who delivers this? Um, so it, it's it's interesting. I mean, you heard a little bit from Dr. Earnshaw about what's in our toolbox. We've kind of combined a couple things here on the deployments of this. So um, we typically have a, a family member and or an individual in recovery um, and telling our stories and personalizing this can help um, address sort of the prejudice and stereotypes that exist, but are components of stigma, and also can build empathy and compassion. But the other component of contact is that we introduce you to some of our favorite physicians, right? Because we are trying to expand and build everyone's under understanding and um, uh, sort of orientation around addiction as this being a health condition, right? Treatable by, um, in the healthcare system, we have medications, we have lots of research and tools in that toolbox. And so introducing you to physicians that can really break this down as part of the intervention. So you've met a few of these folks today. So Dr. Volkoff is a, uh, featured uh, along with Dr. Barry, who received our Pillar of Excellence Award. You met briefly Dr. Gold, Dr. Christian Conti, Dr. Vincent, and Dr. Furline, and we're always adding um, other physicians and other talks to be a part of this to really um, make sure that you're accessing um, addiction psychiatrists, psychologists, and others that are uh, treating patients every day and, and really have um, uh, important knowledge that we want to impart. So I mentioned this, it's the audiences are diverse, the intervention um, and sort of the, um, the intention is to uh, sort of the theory or the concept we had is that if we build knowledge, if we increase literacy around addiction, and we know this from the literature around health literacy and other disease spaces, when you increase health literacy uh, about what diabetes is and how you do you best manage it for both um, for patients that you can um, improve the outcomes for said patients. We know from health literacy from um, other illnesses that have a high impact on family members, right? Whether that's Alzheimer's or autism, when you increase 
um, health literacy among caregivers, you're also imp improving outcomes for both caregivers as well as patients. Um, so we're really trying to draw from and learn from as much literature as we can to build something that works. And then we have the contact both with individuals with lived experience as well as um, physicians. And we're trying to improve that knowledge, improve helping behaviors and confidence and reduce stigma at the same time. We learned, like I mentioned, we've We've uh, tried to be very good students and learn from uh, and meet with every uh, researcher or expert that we can that could help us. Um, develop, develop, developing Encompass um, has really been about four and a half years in the making. Um, there's lots of animations and video explainers. You all know we love our cartoons and we really wanted to make sure that the content was understandable um, to all of our um, to all of our families and anyone, um, regardless of their educational background, how much they previously know about uh, addiction. Also being mindful that sometimes when you're worried about someone you love, you're in crisis yourself. So we should make sure we keep it simple. Um, here's a quick overview of the um, introduction and understanding addiction. We talk about the brain, um, the biopsychosocial approach. We go into a little bit of the DSM-5 and signs and symptoms. We dig into understanding treatment. Uh, we have some pretty amazing physicians that help deliver that content for us. Recovery, including recovery capital um, and, and understanding uh, sort of how you are aware of the components that you need to um, manage recovery and to find health and wellness. Um, we also build in there how family members can support recovery. I'm a huge fan of the uh, developing an action plan. We have worksheets and role playing and activities. It's an interactive training. So you can learn what we discuss here as having an awkward conversation. I work in the addiction field. I don't really like talking to people about alcohol, their alcohol or drug use. I do because you know I, I know how important it is, but it is awkward. We're sort of taught to not talk about these things that it's not our business or it's not um, it, it, it's not appropriate um, and that and yet we're letting an illness worsen around people we care about whether it's friends or family so really breaking down and building on work for both psychologists and psychiatrists in this area so that we can all engage someone right so we are lifting the bottom we are engaging sooner we're intervening sooner so we have better outcomes for our patients um, we talk about some uh, pieces specific to families um, on sort of helping behaviors and enmeshment, we get into self-care and then resources. Um, so very, you know, br quick briefly, I'm not gonna go into this, but one thing I do want to mention is we're really excited to have um, completed 20, well, I think, what are, I'll have to ask Carolyn, uh, Carol Baden and Pastor Greg where we are right now, um, or Alicia might know, um, but we have been conducting um, a pilot test of Encompass in Ohio, and we have, I believe, over 20 Encompass trainings that have already been completed throughout the state. Um, we have a big one coming up next week, which we're really excited about um, for um, anyone across the state to participate in. Um, and so far, we've had well over 700 participants um, with another 700 or so who are uh, signed up for next week. So we've had a, a lot of participation. We've also been able to target availability of the Encompass training for some of the counties that are hardest hit um, by the um, addiction crisis, not just opioids, but the, uh, looking at all SUDs. And it's not an opioid intervention. It's, it's all substance use disorders, everything from alcohol use disorder to opioids to uh, marijuana use disorder. So making sure we cover, um, cover all of this and, and talking a bit about polysubstance use disorder as well. We dig, around, dig in around medications um, for addiction treatments and medications for opioid use disorder, as I mentioned, recovery capital, and we love our worksheets. So there are pieces that you can take with you and make copies of if you need to and use in your professional or personal life to make sure that we are looking out for one another and in engaging and intervening sooner when we're worried about someone. Um, Self-care, just another example of this is important for both um, our patients and our loved ones, but also caregivers and providers, um, those of us working in the field. This is tough and it's hard and it's been a very difficult year and a half. And so I think um, the, the module on self-care and what we all need to be doing to take care of ourselves on a daily basis is an important reminder. And that is sort of a, a quick overview. I'm really um, proud of the program that we've, as we've developed it, um, I think that um, we need to figure out how to scale it up and to make sure we get 
the individual components right and we keep testing it and we rely on data to inform where we take this next and how we can do a better job of engaging certain communities or professional stakeholder groups. But this is a high priority for us. And we're really, we really have ever, uh, been excited to work with Ohio and see all the progress that we've made this year. So at that, I think I hand that back to, uh, uh, to you, Dr. Earnshaw, for an update on the data. Thanks. Okay. So um, it's my pleasure to be able to share some of the preliminary findings from um, the data that we've collected. Um, you've heard about all of the hard work going into this. So the, um, you know, the data is hopefully sort of the fun part. So first, let me tell you a little bit about the overview of the sample. Um, Jess mentioned that the, the first trainings at least have been pretty targeted to the counties that have been hardest hit by um, some of these SUD epidemics. So in the map on the left, the 23 counties in Ohio that represent nearly 80% of total overdose deaths are highlighted in yellow. And then in the map on the right, the counties where the participants were from, um, at least from the data that I'm sharing today, are highlighted in purple. So what I hope that you can see is that there was a pretty nice overlap between these two, meaning that the trainings um, so far have been pretty well targeted to the counties with the most overdose deaths. So it's really um, getting to the people who need it. So I'm gonna be focusing on 312 people from these 20 or so trainings so far who completed both a pre-test and a post-test, meaning that they filled out a survey before and after completing um, Encompass. So here are some of the socio-demographic characteristics of that sample. So 40% of them were in their 30s or, or early 40s. Another 32% were um, in their mid 40s up to 59. Um, most of these folks, about 80% identified as white and non-Hispanic. Um, about 80% identified as women. And about half of them had a college degree. A good number of the sample also had some sort of previous contact with addiction. So 13% of them were in recovery themselves. 35% had a friend or family member who had experienced addiction and about half of them um, worked with addiction professionally. Of that half, 14% said that they were a first responder and 50% of them said that they were a healthcare provider. Okay, so we measured knowledge, stereotypes, prejudice and discrimination. And we did create our own knowledge scale because we couldn't find great ones in the literature. Uh, so we scored it by counting how many of the items participants got correct of the 17 total that we had on the test. So higher scores here are gonna indicate more knowledge. And then we did use previously validated scales for all of the stigma uh, constructs. So participants generally indicated how much they agreed or disagreed with stigma items on one to five point scales. So here, um, higher scores are going to indicate more stigma. We averaged their scores in response to those items. Okay, so as I mentioned, participants were invited to complete surveys before and after they participated. Uh, so here's what we found overall. Uh, the tests before they participated are called the pre-test. Those are in blue. And the tests after they participated are called the post-test. And those are in yellow. And you can see uh, addiction knowledge on the left and uh, the stigma manifestation scores on the right. So what you can see here is that knowledge improved from the pre-test to the post-test. So participants got an average of about 14 out of 17 of the knowledge items correct on the pre-test and an average of 15.74 of them correct on the post-test. Stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination all went down between the pretest and the post-test. And again, these were all measured on uh, five-point scales. So this is good news. You know, this is exactly what we would hope for. Knowledge is going up, stigma is coming down. And for all of those stats folks out there, all of these differences were statistically significant. I was a little bit surprised, and maybe some of you are too, to see such high pretest knowledge here um, scores in the group. So I decided to dig a little deeper. I broke up the sample so that we could take a closer look at individuals who scored a 12 and below on the pretest. So this would be like getting a 70% um, or less on that test. And it ended up being about 25% of the sample. 
So a quarter of the sample ended up in this like no low knowledge group at the beginning of the intervention. So what you can see here in their knowledge change scores is that this group in particular experienced a pretty big jump in knowledge. So this low knowledge group, which is on the left, they went from getting an average of 10.3 items, which would be a 59% in the pretest, to an average of 14.5 items, or an 85% correct in the post-test. So in the courses that I teach, that would be going from a failing grade to a solid B. So that's pretty great progress um, over the course of um, this Encompass intervention. Now the gains for the medium and high knowledge groups were a little bit smaller, but that's really what we would expect given that they started off so high. So we have um, what might be called a ceiling effect here. They just don't have as much room to grow, but this group is still going from a B plus score to a solid A, which is terrific because we, um, we want everybody out there to be a solid A in this um, information. And then here's what the data look like for our stigma items. So again, our uh, low knowledge group is here on the left and our medium and high knowledge group is here on the right. So first I wanna emphasize that just stigma overall is higher among our low knowledge group overall. It's a bit higher at the beginning of the intervention um, as well as at the end of the intervention. And what you can also see is that while the stigma manifestations here are going down in both groups, that the change is bigger in the low knowledge groups. So they're, um, they're reducing in stigma even more, which is great news. So I'm sure uh, some of you on the uh, call like me have a lot of follow-up questions. So as I mentioned earlier, these are preliminary results and these subgroup analyses teasing out just this no low knowledge group from the rest su suggests to me that um, the effect of the intervention might be stronger for some folks who are taking it. So in our follow-up analyses, we're really going to try to continue to explore that. We're going to look at, well, are there differences by, by county, perhaps? Um, were there differences by different types of trainers? Was the intervention um, you know, stronger in, in smaller versus bigger groups? And were there any other subgroups that experienced bigger gains, such as maybe people who never had had an interaction with someone with a substance use disorder before, or people who didn't work in the addiction field? And all of these subgroup analyses are going to give us more information about who can benefit most from the intervention um, so that we can continue to target these efforts. All right, so thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Earnshaw, for walking us through that. It's very exciting to see the data. Um, a couple questions that have come in. Um, oh, Carol shared that uh, it's an incredible curriculum. The impact has been profound for attendees. Thank you for your dedication to Ohio families. Carol Baden is one of our sort of master trainers for Encompass and has really taken on her, her and Pastor Greg Delaney doing most of the trainings in Ohio. So uh, Carol, a lot of this is thanks to you and your, your work and leadership and the time you take. It is not an easy training and it's not an easy topic and you, you, uh, you've done an amazing job. We're very grateful to you. Um, uh, so Amy Shadwick from Recovery Ohio uh, shares that um, we've been in 20 counties and trained over 700 participants, and there are 775 people registered for the training on Monday, which is very exciting and slightly daunting. Um, and then we have a, a question from Felicia. Um, do you plan on allowing Encompass to be available to other states? If so, what is the projected release? Absolutely. We wanted to make sure it worked first, and I think I think it does. Uh, so as we got a, a thumbs up from our re research partner and the evaluation, so we want to move forward expanding this to other states, um, to customizing this for certain stakeholders and professional groups. So Felicia, please reach out. Um, anyone who's interested in Encompass training, please let us know. Um, we have uh, train the trainer uh, pieces. We have um, uh, trainers that APF uh, staff or that APF has already trained. Um, and we've tried to make this, um, you know, sort of doable by having a lot of the content be deliver delivered through videos and from our physicians. Uh, so if you're, if you're interested in being a trainer, also let us know. 
Um, Carol also shared that a number of the trainings have been in partnership with our local mental health and recovery boards. And as such, we had an attendees around 40 counties and several attendees, attendees from outside Ohio as well. Um, Michelle shared that it's really exciting work. I'm looking forward to seeing it transfer to other states. Me too. Are there any questions um, about the program, the curriculum, uh, the um, information and, and Dr. Earnshaw's research on stigma um, or anything else that we can go over? Uh, and Director Nelson, did you have any other comments or um, sort of context or anything to share from, from your vantage point too? I'll just say thank you again. Um, I think this has been a, a wonderful partnership and, and really excited to see this expand across the state. Um, if you like, Jessica, I'm happy to share our link to um, make sure that if anyone on the line today that is listening wants to join us next week, just to get a feel for how great the work um, and pres presenters are and how comprehensive it is, feel free to, to join us. Uh, we are excited as, as it was mentioned and I'm so proud my whole team is here today listening in. Thank you for all of their hard work uh, in, in pulling this together. Um, it, it, it's gonna be an amazing day and we have over 775 folks registered. So uh, please join us if you can. We're really looking forward to it. That's great. I love this QR code thing where you can register right there too. I think uh, the team has also shared the link for registering and you can see the really cool event site and registration page that Recovery Ohio has set up. Um, any qu questions, DA Blodgett or Judge Rancourt? First of all, thanks, Director Nelson and uh, Dr. Earnshaw. The question I have, and I may have missed it, uh, when you're looking at stigma, um, does the impact of culture play into that as well? And how significantly? Um, well, could I, could I answer your question with a question? What aspects of culture are you, are you thinking well, may, about? May, maybe I'm dealing more with race. Okay. You know? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. So from the community member side, um, I'm not as sure, but we know from the experiences of people um, who are affected by substance use disorders that there's pronounced intersections with race on their side. So, um, you know, this sort of coming together of racism and of stigma associated with substance use disorders really fundamentally shapes how people experience um, stigma as well as um, the harms that it has, uh, you know, on recovery itself. I'm less familiar with research looking at um, how does how does race impact, um, you know, prejudice stereotypes and discrimination. We do know that there are, and we have seen this in our data, that there are some gender impacts, wherein um, women sometimes have slightly lower um, stigma than men do, although that doesn't always carry across to some of the prejudice items, which kind of reflect discomfort. Um, so there's some gender effects that we sometimes see, as well as age effects, but I'm not as familiar as with that. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that as well, Dr. So as far as age, adolescence, you know, they may be using. Uh, have you looked at that? Yeah, so um, we have looked at that. Um, we actually just did a, a survey in North Dakota and I'm trying to think back to some of those findings around age. And I actually think that we found this really interesting result that our uh, PhD student who's helping with those analysis, Jenny Sawyer Morris was turning her over in her head, which was that it was actually um, emerging adults, so like the 18 to 29 year olds, because we actually couldn't get adolescents in those surveys, you know, due to um, ethics issues. So we had to start with adults, that young adults and older adults had lower stigma than um, folks in the middle. And so, um, so that's something that I thought was really quite interesting that I hope we can learn more about. Um, but that's, that's at least what we saw in one survey related to age. And did the survey also include tribal members? 
That's a great question. Um, this one in North Dakota certainly did. Um, what was interesting about that is that um, uh, this group of population had way higher experience, you know, and in interactions with people who had experienced addiction. Um, so it's like 75% of the sample had had some sort of per close personal contact in contrast to like 50% or less of um, other folks that actually might've been even closer to 30%. But, um, and we do know that when people have had some sort of interaction that their stigma is lower. So I haven't taken a look overall at the stigma um, or I can't remember off the top of my head because I think we are analyzing that data but we're, we're still doing it so we could get back to you. But I would hypothesize that it's, that it's possible that there might be just some more knowledge and awareness of it. And then there might also be some lower, um, some lower stigma. Although we also do know that friends and families can be the worst, um, you know, perpetrators of stigma as well. So, you know, I sometimes joke around that substance use disorder stigma is actually one of the like trickiest to study for some of these reasons. Well, again, direct Nelson and uh, Dr. Ernshaw, thanks so much for the work you're doing. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> if I may, Jessica, just add um, from a, a stigma perspective, not so much in the research, but in the implementation from our perspective here at the state, uh, Ohio is a diverse, we're really lucky to have a really diverse uh, state. And, and we really had to, to your point around uh, uh, black and brown communities or minority communities, or, or looking at this from an Appalachian perspective, we have uh, uh, several Appalachian counties in our state, we really had to take a step back and look at cultural competence uh, as we applied stigma interventions and, and messages at, and send them out into the communities, understanding that some languages don't have an equivalent to, to mental health and mental illness. Uh, we have a, a very large Somali population and we learn that as we talk to them. And so really understanding who is in your population, understanding that cul those cultural differences is an important, so I'm glad you brought that up, Judge, important uh, factor in making sure that we, we know that before we start to apply some of these interventions and messages. So, so thanks for bringing that up. This is less on a data or research side, but just for some anecdotal um, information to share. Um, in terms of our uh, serving patients and families, um, just as a patient advocacy organization, we have seen that sort of intersection of stigma and racism um, kind of as a head-on collision. So the targets of stigma, um, that I think that there are different experiences based on both race and gender, uh, race, ethnicity, and gender. So for example, we have an awareness program, an awareness campaign that we tell the stories of families who've lost a loved one to overdose. And um, our uh, white uh, families that tell that post a story, um, for example, could have very different Facebook comments than um, black and brown families that tell their story. And almost having to sort of build in, um, you know, and we don't want people to anticipate stigma, but sometimes we need to anticipate, anticipate stigma for real pragmatic reasons. So we need to wrap up our um, African-American families or our Latinx families a little bit more than a Caucasian family just because of the types of responses. Um, is that a little bit of stigma? Yes. Is that more racism? Probably because we have the same population following us on a social media channel that will have a different a response to um, a family's struggle with addiction. So I, I do think that, um, it, it, you know, what, I'm gonna work on more data for Dr. Earnshaw on how we can better quantify this and understand um, the process that's happening because I think it really harms our communities of color and it means that uh, stigma and racism kind of hitting you simultaneously, I think makes this illness even harder to navigate. And it's a really high priority for us to do a better job of helping communities that are underserved. Any other questions or things from our audience? Well, we'll have the um, recording of the um, presentation and uh, the slides and the overview. We'll put up uh, Director Nelson's um, 
slide with the QR code too. So you can uh, follow the link or find it on our website to join us for Encompass. Um, if you're interested in more about the research or more about um, stigma, I encourage you to take uh, our stigma e-course which uh, features Dr. Earnshaw um, and Dr. Uh, ben Howell from Yale uh, to talk about um, criminal justice stigma. Um, we have a free course uh, that we've been working on in partnership with, uh, with NIDA that we're really excited to make available for free to, uh, to the public. And uh, Director Nelson, just thank you for, for making this a reality. Um, you know, this time last year, we didn't really have a plan and now over 700 people have um, received you know something that was a, a, a dream a year ago and we have an amazing researcher who's had an evaluation underway to make sure that we're building something that works so I'm, I'm very grateful to you both I think this is a, a really exciting pilot and results and now I think we double down and and take this further even in 2022.